The rules of welfare, don't work, don't save, don't get married, we'll just keep you enslaved to this poverty plantation, don't work. And I know it firsthand. Hi, I'm Tracy Oppenheimer for Reason TV. I'm here with Star Parker, founder and president of CURE, the Center for Urban Renewal Education. Why would someone be against the war on poverty? This whole notion that we should even have a war on poverty um, dismisses the fact that individuals uh, have a role in their own lives. I know firsthand about welfare, welfare dependency because of my own life living seven years in and out. We have attempted to reform welfare in the 90s to say at least work should be attached to this. I'm one that really believes the government has no business in charity, that this is for communities, this is for the private sector to help those who really cannot help themselves. The next step out of poverty is work. So they have to develop a work ethic. Well, minimum wage laws aren't helping. The very people that want a war on poverty set up minimum wage laws. <laughs> well, they're keeping people from being able to work. Uh, they set up regulations against business. They disdain business. Third step out of poverty, education. The very people who want this war on poverty are the ones standing away of parents having choice in education. Saving and investing, fourth step out of poverty. The very people who say, let's have a war on poverty are the ones standing away of saving and investing. They are the ones that are hitting us hardest when we say, maybe people should own their retirement. Why don't we at least engage the discussion about money following you to the retirement account that you own instead of the black hole of Social Security? So they're not serious. And even in charity, the fifth step out of poverty to give back, oh, they stand in a way there too. They'd rather us not be able to tax deduct. They don't like the fact that you have even religious organizations that say, we'll help. Specifically with your experience with uh, dependency on the welfare system, what insight has that given to you that you think is uh, unique that most other politicians don't have access to? Well, I've been there, done that. These politicians who've never been anywhere near an impoverished community and or person who try to say this is the only way we're going to do business here uh, are not even willing to listen. You mentioned the reform in the 90s, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, I did face a lot of resistance. Uh, there was a big scare for kids going hungry, more people living in the streets, even a full-blown urban crisis. Mm -hmm. In the words of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, one of the fathers of the War on Poverty, we're now 15 years past that. Mm -hmm. um, it's 2011. Could you say what the differences are between then and now, and do we need more reform still? Yes, we need more reforms, and I was very much involved in and consulting on federal welfare reform, and I brought my personal life experiences to the table uh, to try to assess what do we need to do as a society to get people to be more responsible with the choices that they're making. And you're right, there was a very aggressive left uh, that liked the status quo. They didn't care how broken uh, uh, the communities were becoming or the people that we said that we were trying to help. Uh, in fact, I received several death threats at that time just because I was consulting on the federal welfare bill. But post-welfare, what we saw based on what we knew, 98% were just single women trying to raise children, uh, and we knew that 90% of them had high school diplomas, that they had some work experience, that they knew what to do to transition their lives and yet needed a nudge to do such. Right after welfare reform was passed, we saw those women leave and go to work. The roles dropped in half. We didn't see babies starving. We didn't see people dying in the streets. Do we still need more reform on a local level? Absolutely. While numbers are going up because unemployment has gone up, so many are going to government to look for food stamps and or some type of subsidy. The system itself has to be totally overhauled and changed. Could you maybe rate Obama's administration in regards to welfare, uh, maybe give him a grade? His grade is F. I mean, keep in mind that in the 60s when they started the social engineering, black family life was relatively intact. 22 percent out of wedlock birth rates. Today, 72 percent. They collapse the family. What Barack Obama's attempting to do is spread that out into our great middle class and our, and our um, suburban communities. These are the same ideas, but we've already tried them, and you can look into any and every one of those 4,000 housing projects that are still left standing and say, this is not what we should be doing for the rest of the country. This is the wrong direction. Do you think that the current system marginalizes minorities? When you think about the civil rights movement, it was a movement to remove governmental barriers. Jim Crow was a governmental barrier. Remove these barriers so that we can educate, so that we can attain um, economic success. Uh, rather than us continue on that journey to say, okay, we've removed these barriers, now go live free, 
uh, many that took up the mantle after Dr. King's death went to Washington and politicized the movement. And so you started seeing the interest of the community move toward government intervention. When you think about government intervention, not only did the welfare class uh, start to unravel that entire community, uh, the working class started to become addicted to government. Today, the government is the number one employer of black men and the second largest employer of black women. This should not occur in a free society. What about the people who started at rock bottom, whether it be a mental or physical handicap, um, or just those who grew up in the absolute worst situation? Two things. Number one, you've got to be able to identify who they are amongst us that absolutely cannot help themselves. They have no one, they have no resources. That's actually one reason we should ha not have the government in this business. They can't identify. This is only done on a very local and personal level. Number two, once we've identified them, how do we help? How do we really help those that cannot help themselves? Well, you empower their charities. Local charities need empowerment. How do you do that? Does the government redistribute $700 billion, Or do you allow free people to freely give to the charity they most want to? This is why I'm for charity tax credits. Number three, though, what has to happen on the second part of your question, those that can't help themselves and or they're just at risk because of the environment that they lived in. Their parents are total losers, and now they're stuck. That's why it's so important to have school choice. We must allow for money to follow children to the school that their parent and or the community will best be able to serve them through. I know you do talk a lot about or put a lot of emphasis on faith. Uh, can you pull yourself out of poverty without religion? People can pull themselves out of poverty without religion. But that said, when you're talking about those most at risk, they have to know why they believe what they do. Without a moral compass, which some do take for granted, we can call it religion or we can just call it a moral compass. Short of that, you cannot then uh, define right from wrong. So what we want to do is make sure that they have a moral framework built inside of them as they mature to become adults. This is where religious instruction uh, can serve them best. I know you've had a very multifaceted career. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about what you've done so far and uh, what you plan to do in the near future? Through my organization, Cure, we've built out a pastor program so that we can inform them about what is broken down in their community so that they can focus more on fixing it, working then to get them to open schools once again. Uh, professionally, I would like to see a whole lot of legislative changes. I think just economically, if we were to do something as simple as um, personal retirement accounts and Social Security, we could break cycle of poverty in one generation. Mm -hmm.